Tony, thank you so much for joining us today as we begin. Can you say a few words about what you're working on right now? Uh, yeah, right now I'm just um, I'm just finishing some work on a uh, Paskey's solution um, for a venture company that I that I started. Um, I I spent the last two years trying to build a platform to deliver uh, FIDO2 compliant Paskeys because mm -hmm. I feel very strongly that Paskeys are the way we kind of dig ourselves out of the pit that we have created for ourselves with passwords. So this is a true move towards passwordless. Um, and I think we're finally at a time when we have a, an actual viable alternative to passwords. Oh, wow. I think it's um, given how they're used as an entry point and so many uh, attacks and so many exploits, it's certainly something that I imagine probably is going to be well received. So is it, you mentioned uh, it's part of a VC fund. So is it a start part of the startup that you're part of, or is it one of the several ventures you're fun you've funded? Yeah. So this is um this is something that I founded and funded. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for a, a few reasons. You know, startups can be very risky endeavors, but um but in general, I do feel like the market is very rich for this type of solution and think there is nothing but opportunity moving ahead in the space. Mm -hmm. So it's actually uh, as, as a part of a startup. Yeah, it, it was. It is. It is mm -hmm. now finished. I see. I understand. I understand. And um, I saw on your, pro on your LinkedIn profile, you had a, a range of uh, various executive positions, cybersecurity uh, and financial services. I think Wells Fargo was one of them. But how did you get into this space? Yeah, so I was kind of one of those people who like to just break things and see how they work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I, I found will. computers, I kind of got into that and, and, and sort of kept going with it and, um, you know, got involved in cybersecurity uh, via, you know, some of my early work as a sysadmin, you know, just kind of being less interested in keeping the systems going and more interested in seeing how I could break them and fix the security aspects of it. Got into penetration testing and kind of one thing led to another and I moved into more of a, a leadership role at, um, at you know, in, in sort of fintech companies like Visa and, and Wells Fargo. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, and then I also built and led the Cyber Defense Center at um, at Gap, so that mm -hmm. was pretty exciting. Interesting, interesting. So going from tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of employees, large organization, uh, large org, and and kind of challenges to go with going the startup route. It, it's interesting. You have kind of perspectives of both worlds uh, in that regard. So first, just kind of comments. Uh, on what prompted you to make this transition other than, I would imagine probably kind of the need uh, to fix the issues that, as you mentioned, related to passwords, but how did you find the, dif the different environment in terms of scope, but also in terms of pace, um, number one, and number two, um, broadly, for someone who's maybe more junior, they're just starting their cybersecurity career, Given that you have such a wide range of experiences, what would be your advice in terms of where those individuals should spend their time on? What two, three things that should uh, really double click on? Yeah, I think more broadly, I think what should people think about or or focus on? I I would say just be curious. I I think everything that I've done has usually been out of kind of wondering why something works and why does it work that way or why is why are things this way and i think if you approach any problem whether it's cybersecurity or otherwise with that as a starting point you kind of don't give up until you have a good understanding of it um you know you you can't help but be successful in in what you're doing then i'd say you know i guess kind of what what you were saying you were kind of asking you know moving from large organizations to the startup type environment how was it i'd say no matter where i've been i think as security professionals what helps give you a better chance of success is trying to understand what what the business is that you're working at so a lot of times when you know especially when you're coming from an engineering role you know, you're kind of caught up in the in the details and the minutia of you know it's like oh this incident happened or you know this you know this particular identity service failed or whatever and you're kind of focused in in very specific problems but as you move into leadership roles kind of taking a step back and kind of understanding how the businesses work 
and and seeing yourself as part of that business and the work that you do impacts the success and you know in a lot of cases you know you're you're trying to sell something to someone you're 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 a company trying to to make money and so you know sort of approaching things with that is a great way to i think inform how we talk about security and and i'd say going into the startup and having that kind of entrepreneurial entrepreneurial mindset is sort of always how i'd oper- of, uh, excuse me how i've always operated Mm-hmm. So, you know, I kind of took that and you certainly have a much greater sense of ownership at a startup where you, know, you do make the decisions and you do make the calls that, mm-hmm. that, that shape the direction, but, but really just approaching any role with that kind of entrepreneurial mindset, knowing that, you know, you're there to try to deliver value for the business, not just make these kind of authoritative security decisions. I, I think that's, I think that's the path to success. Interesting. Interesting. So not forgetting that you're also wearing a business hat and and seeing yourself as an enabler of business, not just as a department of no, as sometimes uh, cybersecurity is referred to. But but I think it's it's certainly changing, kind of in in, in the same vein that that you're describing that uh, approaching problems as keeping the goal of the business overarching goal of the business in mind as you as you approach some of the cybersecurity challenges. And speaking of challenges, I know that there's kind of like big themes out there but in cloud security and and you know phishing attacks, ransomware, uh, take your pick. From your perspective and kind of from your experience, and I'm sure you, you keep tabs on what's going on in, in, in the cybersecurity world, what are top three challenges that are facing cybersecurity executives right now? If you if you were to bucket them, what would those three buckets be? I mean, I I guess I would just start with identity management being the biggest and most important thing right now. I think it is so important from kind of every aspect of of what you do in cybersecurity is knowing who someone is and what their entitlements are or what they should and shouldn't be doing is kind of the key to everything. And and you kind of see that percolate down through all sorts of the orgs. And and now, you know, as it pertains to cloud, everything is identity management and access management um, because there is no more of that kind of soft, chewy center model of security that we always used to have. So I think, I think that's probably the biggest most burning issue in my mind, I'd say following on from that is product security and ensuring that the products that we bring to market are built with some kind of a security mindset. mindset. And that's not to say that we need to have security driving product because I, I, I don't think that, but I do feel that if as a part of your development cycles, you're being mindful of and, um, and, and always paying attention to particular potential security issues and data security issues for your users that will become beneficial to you as you go on when when you don't when you don't get breached or mm-hmm. you're less likely to be breached um and then i think kind of lastly i think phishing is something that has just continued to plague us and i suppose that's kind of tied into identity in, in a way but but the idea of now you have attackers using models specifically trained off of customer support emails for every company under the sun. So you can generate, you know, effectively the perfect phishing email with none of those grammatical errors or, you know, typeface problems that you used to see, but actually like perfect, um, you know, perfect replicas of of a password reset email or, or a tech support email because they're using models that have nefariously been trained off of a huge data set of official models. Now, phishing attacks are much, much harder to identify and see for users. So being more mindful of how we can, you know, try to not just chase, you know, phishing like we have been and, and mm-hmm. you know, kind of get in front of it with a more secure solution like passkeys, I think is something that, um, that that we should be focusing on. Interesting. And, and to double click on the product security that you mentioned, does it mean that cybersecurity professionals, cybersecurity executives would need to be involved in product more upstream that, than they are now? Because it's, how would this trend kind of, or this concern would play out and w- what kind of action steps should CIOs, CTOs, 
CISOs, whoever owns product would would take? Is it kind of moving cybersecurity conversations more more upstream? Is it kind of one uh, way of addressing this? Is it using different tools? Is it using you know, co-pilots that are created with cybersecurity in mind? Like, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I guess, you know, there's probably a lot of different ways to answer that. But, but I think, you know, certainly the way I think of it from more of the leadership mindset is to be much more involved with uh, your product teams and try to understand more of the business problems that, that the company is trying to solve with the product and also understanding the customer needs better mm -hmm. as well can kind of help put you into that sort of Venn diagram of, you know, of, of product security. I just think the more involved we are as cybersecurity professionals in all aspects of that product development life cycle, the more, I guess, informed and the more empathy we can have for the different parts of the process and the more connected we can feel to it and the, and the different perspectives that, that we can apply um, to those decisions can help, you know, in, in a lot of cases and, you know, going back to past keys, for a moment, you know, just as an example, that's a good solution for customers. It certainly simplifies a lot of the the challenges that we've always had with customers where, you know, people forget their passwords all the time and get locked out of their accounts. And so, you know, that in itself can be a product feature that's beneficial for customers and also simplifies a business problem. So there, there are lots of alternatives like that, that security practice, practitioners could help identify as part of the product development life cycle. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of ways we can, we can for be sure. more beneficial. For sure. For sure. I think a lot of CISOs, they, uh, they haven't made the jump yet. They probably are at various organizations of various sizes, financial services, healthcare, and they see at their own work and they see gaps uh, in terms of cybersecurity products that vendors either are not aware of, maybe it's something is falling through the cracks, maybe just too niche uh, of a problem to, to address. It, it's an edge case, but it's really annoying. And they're like, well, I'll just build my own company. I'll raise money and, I, and I'll build it. And then they make this jump or, or don't. But for those who are seriously considering that transition, from the from your experience, what are some of the learnings? If you could talk to yourself, uh, while at Wells Fargo, what 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 would you've told yourself? What are the two or three things to be mindful of or to be aware of uh, during that transition to to set yourself? I mean, because it's it's a it's a change in in so many different ways. Uh, what should be what should be people what should people be mindful of as they're contemplating that? Yeah, contemplating contemplating a jump from from big company to venture. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a few things. I think first of all, having an idea and identifying a problem is definitely the first step to it. And and I've been working with some some colleagues on on something that that is a product and it is done and it works. But you know that is a, that is amazing and it solves a problem. But then you have as a business. How do I make money with this? So being very mindful of that. And, and the security market is really weird because there are a lot of tools and ideas that we can think of that aren't particularly great at making money because maybe a company only needs to use it once or twice a year. Um, and, and in that kind of a case, there's just not much of a business there, um, you know, unless you can get some kind of a contract with a large enterprise. But there's only so many of those and, um, and, and working with large enterprises, again, that, that brings other problems that, that you probably can't deal with as a small startup. Um, so just trying to be mindful of like, it's a great idea and it works. That's fantastic. And a first start, but the other idea is, can I make money with this? And am I getting feedback from the right people? Um, you know, and another tendency that I think we have when we're in problem solving mode and engineering mode is, We'll go out and talk to other people, engineers that have this problem, who might not be decision makers at the company. And so the problem that they're solving maybe helps them solve a problem. But if you're only presenting it to people who are definitely helping you validate and understand the problem and the solution, but they're not the decision makers, you might not be able to make your 
product business case to the decision makers in a way that gets them to sign off on it. So just trying to be more mindful about how you're getting that validation and that feedback, I, I think helps and make sure you're not, you know, just targeting very specific people who are kind of in your mindset. You need to kind of think more broadly about how does this fit in the market. Certainly. It's interesting that you mentioned that because it's, there's also this known phenomenon when people cheer you on and give you positive feedback. And 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 uh, when when you say, well, I build what you ask for, now pay me. And like, well, uh, you're not in the budgeting cycle. Let me talk to my CFO. So validating, thinking right. of not just the product, but thinking of the go-to-market strategy and yep. actually validating this demand. Like, will, will you sign the contract? If we build it, we'll... Impl- we'll sign a pilot with some dollars involved. And so, because that, that tends to kind of qualify or disqualify some of those potential buyers uh, right off the bat. Yeah. And or, then, Hey, yeah. this is really cool. Here's a thousand bucks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, And it's like, then when you start doing the math on that, you're like, Oh, wow, I need 30,000 companies in order to make some revenue here. Uh Oh, you know, it's like, exactly. it, it becomes, you know, suddenly you find yourself outside the security mindset and into some kind of a in in into some kind of a business mindset and and that can be kind of jarring for a lot of security professionals. Exactly, but I think it's it's very important exercise to do up front because some something that you think is a cool product, maybe it's a feature, it's a cool feature mm-hmm. of an existing product and it's completely different proposition and completely different economics and Absolutely. fundability of sorts uh when you go right when you go raise money. Very interesting. Um I think it's it's certainly a valid valid consideration for for people who are considering of of, of whom I'm sure there are many, um, because it's obviously if you are in day to day and you see something that's just just obvious problem, it's uh, it's very painful not to actually go fix it and then build a product out of it. Um, speaking of vendors, uh, Tony, I I always sometimes when you talk to cybersecurity executives and you bring up the topic of vendors, it Often you get this almost visceral reaction. Um, people get very emotionally kind of involved because on the one hand, you obviously need cybersecurity vendors. You, we rely on their products every day. But at the same time, a lot of them have very active salespeople who are adequately incentivized to go after everyone and everything. So naturally, there's uh, sometimes there's this friction. Uh, what's your... from from your time um, at financial services organizations, uh, but also now you have a product. So again, you have a very interesting perspective. Um, looking back a couple of years, what would be some of the examples without naming names um, of some of your biggest pet peeves with vendors and, and some of the vendors who may have surprised you on the positive side, what, what, what did they do? Uh, could you give could, could you give us some anecdotes from, from bo- for, for both? Yeah, so I'd say from the customer standpoint, I think, um, you know, as a customer, I usually have a problem. And so, you know, when I was working at at the bank or, you know, at, 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 at retail or whatever, you know, I had a problem. And, and I would say I always really enjoy the vendors who are very clear and concise about their messaging. You know, we solve this problem and this is how we do it. Sometimes I think you get a little bit too wandering in the wording of products. And sometimes I would know a product solved my problem, but then I'd go to the website and I would have absolutely no idea what it did. Um, You know, so just trying to be much clearer in communications, I think can help you as a vendor cut through that noise and, you know, really get to the heart of, of what's going on. I'm sure there are marketing people here who are saying that's not how it works, but, <laughs> you know, but, but that's fine. Um, you well, know, that's, that, how that's just me as a customer. Yeah. Right. And, and I'd say as far as specific vendors, you know, I don't, I don't usually, you know, as, a, you know, as a former CISO, you just get inbounded constantly. I don't, you know, I usually just kind of mentally take note of who's doing what, but the landscape changes so frequently and there are so many mergers and acquisitions. I only really entertain vendors when I have a specific problem. And when something's not working for me, then I would kind of go to market and look around more proactively at how could I solve my problem and then try to get a better understanding of the space. So I, I always, you know, sort of viewed it as being more proactive, um, you know, rather than, you know, responding to a, you know, a vendor coming in and saying, Hey, you probably have this problem. Don't you? It's like, well, I don't know. I, 
you know, if I did, I'd probably find you. Um, <laughs> So, you know, and, and again, I'm sure there are salespeople who are saying that's not how it works, but, you know, from that mindset, um, but, you know, sort of flipping it, um, I was a vendor <laughs> when I had my startup. And, and so I would say, um, I, I would say building those relationships early on with people who have your problem. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or just spending time with people and understanding, even if you think they have a problem, spending time with them to understand and validate that you definitely are building a product that can solve their problem. So then you can present them something and, and then they can see the value right then and there. You know, I, I did a bit of that, but not nearly enough of that. And, you know, I don't think that's what made or broke us. You know, we, we had, we had other issues that, that caused us not to succeed, but but um, but but I would say and encourage anyone to to start building those relationships really early on, uh, and and you know find a lot of them and and talk to you know, a lot more people and try to get a lot of feedback early on with your product because it might feel like you're giving something away for free, but if it's truly something that provides a company with value and you really are solving that problem and you can demonstrably show my product makes you this much money, they're gonna do it. Totally. Totally. It makes a lot of sense. Well, and again, it's kind of like this one thing that we, we're hearing more and more. If you're not transactional, if you have the patience and the horizon uh, to build a relationship and really um, think long-term and you, your communication and your actions support that, that's, that's usually often the win, uh, the winning strategy is just unfortunate that, a lot of vendors live quarter quarter to quarter, and then they it tends to push, creates an, it would create incentives that are not not on point and a kind of more skew actions and skew communication to more transactional side of things, unfortunately. Uh, but again, it's it's so obvious from just talking to people that the winning strategy is really kind of taking the long long term view. Um, uh, Tony, switching gears a little bit, I know there are so many different. Communities, conferences, uh, Slack channels. Uh, there's uh, Gartner and Avanta events and, and things like this. So there, it's. I think it goes to the point that cybersecurity, in essence, it's a it's a team sport. So the good guys in one team fighting the bad guys, and and it's when we're in siloed, we lose. Um, what what what's your take on? And at Afinia, we obviously, we try a lot of different things. We, we're trying to be extremely aware, conscious and aware of time being a very critical resource for a lot of our members. So we don't want to create too much content, too many requests on anyone's time. But we do try different things in terms of engagement, interaction, value uh, that we bring to the table and see what where we get traction, what sticks, and we kind of double, double down on that. From your perspective, from the different communities, different groups that you're involved in, uh, what are you looking, what's for you the best value out of them? Um, what would kind of com compel you or what would make it interesting for you to be part of them and to engage? Uh, yeah, I think from, I, I just talked, maybe I could just talk about events um, that I think work have worked well and, and things that work well. Um, I, I mean, I was just recently at a B-Sides in Reykjavik and, you know, I really liked the way that team put it together. It was a few presentations and lots of opportunities for networking and just kind of chatting with people about their problems. And it was very light on the vendor side of things. Um, so, you know, I think for me, that was great because I, you know, I was able to kind of connect with some some peers and, and learn about the problems specific to that region, which was really interesting. Um, and I would say other events that I have found pretty beneficial are some where it's more of a dialogue with, you know, a few leaders and experts just kind of getting together and kind of chatting about the problem and sharing experiences and kind of building the building that cyber, you know, sort of cybersecurity community. I think those are really good. Um, and then as far as conferences and things go, I really tend to like the more technical side of things like the IEEE does a security and privacy summit or what do they call it a symposium 
uh, that meets usually in the springtime. And those are oftentimes very academic, but I always kind of like to think of it as the DEF CON and Black Hat preview, because a lot of the stuff that gets presented there is stuff that kind of later filters its way into DEF CON and Black Hat presentations mm -hmm. a couple of years later. So those are really uh, interesting things. It is it is very difficult sometimes to sit through PhD level presentations in cybersecurity, but it's also incredibly rewarding when you when you are able to kind of be there as a, you know, as a new problem is kind of emerging. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And of course, DEF CON, I, I think is, is really great. I love the fact that it's, you know, pretty vendor agnostic. And, you know, I know when I go to a, a talk at, at DEF CON, nobody's trying to sell me anything. And I'm, and I'm usually getting, you know, the actual reality of, of what it's like for, for those people and, and sort of the benefit of their research without sort of strings attached. Um, sure. That, that sure. tends to work for me. It's interesting that you mentioned that some of the events give you almost a preview of what the future is going to hold. Uh, and it's it's interesting that it's it, in your experience, it's coming from academia and kind of with this in mind, I know I'm coming up on time a little bit. If you had mm -hmm. a crystal ball and you can see clearly into the future, 12 months from now, CISOs will be talking about what three things, whether it's threats, technologies, challenges, solutions, what would those be? Uh, I'd say in 12 months time, people are going to be getting real serious about pass keys. And you're going to see a lot more of that at the customer side and on the enterprise side. So I think maybe some of those discussions are starting to happen now. I think there are a few things that need to happen first to get people more comfortable with using them. Uh, you know, just even having heard a presentation to cybersecurity people last week on it, um, you know, people can't believe it is secure because it's too easy. So, you know, there is kind of that hurdle of, you know, the mental state of, of, of where people are to get them ready. But, but I'd say in the next 12 months, that'll be something that's more mature. I would say there will be continual challenges for CISOs with regards to generative AI. And I mean, very specifically, um, better phishing emails. Uh, you know, there's, I, I know, a, I have a, a, I have a peer that's working on a, on a product that does really good quality voice synthesis. So I think those types of threats will, will be better. You'll have better types of social engineering um, because of how easy this stuff is to use. Uh, so I think that will continue to get worse. And then I think attacks against existing AI models will happen as well. I think we'll see an increase of uh, model theft, uh, you know, poisoning in the well is a, is a type of attack that I think we'll start to see a lot more of where people are targeting uh, companies, you know, leveraging data and, you know, trying to poison that data to corrupt models. So I, I think there will be a lot more work, you know, to, to kind of break people's AI. Um, so, you know, I sure hope people are aware of that. I know I certainly am. So. So it's interesting. The, uh, well, I'm old enough to remember when kind of email just, appeared on the scene and how it was a novel and amazing product but people kind of wondered what the applications would be since then it's it's to me it's incredible how much more how much bigger role technology is playing in everyone's life on the personal level uh company level country level it's 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 uh and the bigger role it plays the more dependent we're on it and and the the more we suffer when when it gets compromised so it's certainly mm -hmm. There, there, there's some job security in that for, for I guess, like a better term. Tony, I know we're kind of up on time. I, I'm really appreciative of your, uh, your sharing your insights. It's, uh, it was a very interesting conversation. Where can people find you? What's the best way to connect? Uh, you know, usually LinkedIn is probably the easiest and best place to find me. I'm pretty responsive on there. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm one of those weirdos who does respond to inbounds on LinkedIn usually, unless you're trying to sell me something. Even if it's a no. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey, you know what? Every no is a is a future conversation, you know. So who knows, right? So yeah, that, that's probably the best place to find me. Absolutely. Tony, thank you so much. All right, thank you.